Well, it is my honor to reintroduce Shergul Arshad, um, head of Aston Martin F1 North America. Um, just a quick background on it. Uh, I was completely excited to have this conversation, not only because of my um, passion for F1 and automotive being from Detroit, um, but also his passion for sports in general and really how his career has come to this point. Um, little do you know that he is also a best-selling novelist um, with a book about uh, all the different amazing sporting events that he has attended over the years. It's a, it's a, a must-buy on Amazon if you're looking for it. So. Um, but for, prior to um, being at Aston Martin, um, Chargul was at uh, Statsbomb as the chief commercial officer, um, which really brings uh, advanced analytics to global football. Um, prior to that, a number of different locations, such as DraftKings and founding iSport Consulting, to help tech, gaming, and sports startups. And then also head of digital um, for AC, AS Roma um, and building out that, that football team. So thank you so much for, for being here. Thanks for having me. Hello again, everybody. I guess everyone was here for Spirit Airlines, but thank you for staying. <laughs> I thought I would, <laughs> yeah. I thought I'd first start out just to give you the opportunity um, in this new role of head of North America and chief sales executive, you know, what are the key roles and responsibilities um, that you've been charged with taking on? Yeah, so again, it was a growing team. Um, because we were a new entity as of three years ago, the commercial team in particular was all new. And what they had was a strong base of people in the UK. And for a number of reasons, from accents to uh, um, cultural references, uh, it was very strong in speaking to a lot of the European touch points and time zones as well. Um, when then having to connect with lots of companies in America, uh, there was a disconnect, both um, from an accents to culture to time zones. Um, so Jeff Slack, our managing director, who actually originally hails from Boston as well, uh, was quite keen on having a guy, um, you know, to, to be in, in the U.S. And so Peter and myself uh, have been over here. And the key roles and responsibilities are everything from evangelizing what we're doing as a team, evangelizing what we're doing as a sport, um, a lot of a lot by popularity and the growth, but really a lot of the trends in all of F1 are moving towards this part now. So, you know, the United States in particular. So, brands in the past that maybe had shied away from Formula One because they thought of it as it's too international. We just sell in the U.S. And, you know, stuff that maybe in the past you're like, oh well, that's the thing that happens in Singapore and Monaco. You know, now if you kind of quick stat, which is staggering. Las Vegas this year is hosting Grand Prix. They're hosting the Super Bowl next year. Las Vegas has come out and said that they're expecting four revenue to stick in Formula One. So ignoring Formula One, especially because it's not just the Super Bowl, right? You're talking about this Grand Prix this weekend. It's lost under 400,000 people last year. Uh, Las Vegas, and then Montreal, Mexico City. I mean, North America, you've got five of the 23 races. So part of our story is for U.S.-focused brands, you know, you should be not ignoring uh, working with the team in Formula One. And then for brands that maybe sell something outside of the U.S., and you've only been focusing on the, you know, the NFL and the NBA, I mean, these are sports where... Uh, they're obviously super popular in this country, and every other country are not even in the top five. It's amazing to think that. I think it's important to also to help educate the, the crowd, the people in media and brands, on really you know the differences between marketing sponsorships between say a, a team, um, F1 in general, and or even. A yeah, it's a great categorization. There's sort of three types of investment that a brand can make within Formula One. So Formula One is sort of the league, right? Um, has a, obviously a huge price point to enter and you are associated with all the races, but you're not associated with any of the drivers um, and you don't have any kind of presence on a car by default. Um, and so therefore, 
while there's these 23 races where you get featured uh, on most of the year, uh, you know, 330 other days, it, you're not as uh, relevant in the, the cycle of a team and the dynamics of rolling out a new car and a car launch and all the things associated with the team. A racetrack is great for local marketers. So if you're a Miami-based business or Florida-based business and you know, really like want to do something with the track because it's good for your employees and it's good for kind of uh, civic duty or, or also just to reach your consumers in one market, that kind of makes sense. But again, it's sort of come and gone in one weekend and you're not going to be talked about for the rest of the year. I think engaging with the team, and again, I can talk a little bit later about why Aston Martin, but I think any team at some point is a journey, a 365-day journey, but also we talk to our partners about the journey to the top, and it's like a five to 10-year journey together, and you're part of us in some ways. You know, Now we can finally say maybe we're in day two, but we were in day one up until uh, the start of this season where partners that join us are part of everything we do, a car launch process and a new factory that we're investing $300 million into. Um, this can be the first new factory, the first new office headquarters in Formula One in 20 years. So, um, you know, that, that, that leads to all kinds of cool ESG initiatives and ways for brands in the technology space to tie in directly, help us uh, uh, power the building in whatever capacities from electricity, light bulbs, computers, um, energy drinks, whatever it might be. So uh, having an embedded presence at the very beginning um, is quite exciting. So again, that journey then manifests itself across these races, but then the drivers go home and you know there, there's like, you're part of a, a fabric for 365 uh, days, which is, I think, you know, you're going to look at the different types of investment spelling that out for you, at least hopefully education. I think we'll come back to the headquarters of part one. Um, one of my questions lines of how are you approaching your sales uh, um, And, you know, what's that? Yeah, I mean, so we've really taken a uh, partner centric approach. Um, one of the things that we found, uh, again, taking a fresh look, which we were allowed this amazing opportunity to come into a sport just over years ago, uh, is you come in with fresh eyes and see what some of the teams are doing. And again, I won't name any other team, but there are some teams that are extremely arrogant around, here's your tickets and your slap a logo on the car and please stay away and don't mess up our brain and we won't put some social media on the driver's end. Then there's other teams that will kind of farm out an asphalt like they can put like a gazillion little stickers. And again, they'll have the problem that they can't service any uh, uh, partner very well. So our focus is look, we are Aston Martin as a brand. We treat everyone with this kind of inclusive, exclusive experience where people that are part of our brand are treated almost to uh, amazing partners. So, we've over-invested in partnership services. So it's about helping the partner deliver a goal. So in some cases, it might be a beer wanting to be seen as a premium beer because they're associated now with Aston Martin and James Bond. And so it might be cognizant and trying to sell more consulting arrangements around the world by talking about the hospitality. Uh, so I think, you know, I guess at, at the core of it is that every single party that we start with has a different kind of justice. Uh, everything from branding goals and awareness goals to measurable ROI around new customers that they sell into. Uh, and then the types of assets that we can deploy vary vastly by that part. Uh, Yeah, again, it goes back to this. No, it gets very disposed and disposal. One of the most requested assets they have is actually one racing drivers. So 
Um, that's the type of a company that wouldn't necessarily be the first company that you think of, um, but we're able to really deliver on that type of partnership um, by providing access to drivers into races. Uh, another one, uh, to the largest partnership with Citibank, and I was around some of the folks uh, at a Miami race today. Uh, we did in January with people to drive uh, two of our different model cars around the racetrack on the board club. And, you know, the excitement level that they can see to bring to their private high net with clients and customers and bring them um, to their corporate customers as well. So the entertainment platform that that can create for people um, is quite fascinating. And again, an average Formula One team does between two and three new partnerships a year with a very high retention rate. It's almost like once you get involved with a team, you want to be part of that journey. Um, but we, we were fortunate that we've done seven new partnerships this year. Uh, we're on, you know, on case of more, and I think, you know, we, we, we control that car as an asset. We can choose sizes of placements. We can choose to get allocation. So we have a lot of autonomy. Um, and that, that's something that we as well. Uh, nice drink. Which it makes sense. You know, what's funny is that uh, I am actually going to be in the paddock for the first time this weekend, but I have uh, quite a few insights on what that's like. It's sort of, you know, it's, it's beyond going through, let's say, a Super Bowl, which might be a very comfortable experience. Super Bowl, you're there, you're very focused on the the process. You know, the first few hours in the house. Um, when you go to a Formula One paddock and you're there for three days, essentially you're talking about garage tours and lunches and some of the drivers come up to the paddock and make speeches and the, the team principal on the guy might track them up and speak to the guests. Uh, when you then bring our guests from the paddock club down to the garage itself, uh, it's. I, I got to experience this at Imola, Italy last year. I couldn't believe that 10 minutes before the start of the race, it starts to rain. And somehow I'm standing in the garage with the two cars and Vettel and Stroller freaking out because it's raining. And there's all kinds of computers and like people are walking by me. Thank you very much. Uh, people are walking by me in panic mode because, you know, tire changes. And I was like... This is 10 minutes before the start of the race. I mean, if I was in Bill Belichick's locker room 10 minutes before the start of the Super Bowl, you know, things would be flying at my head. Uh, and, and I'm a Patriots fan. So um, I think that, that the, uh, the experience that you can get, uh, just kind of being part of all that. And then, of course, you get to, you know, instead of drive the car, you walk upstairs to this premium entertainment experience. But I think what our partners and partners in general find is that it's that three days worth of networking, even amongst themselves. Uh, so Cognizant, again, uh, our title sponsor, along with the Ramco, they've attributed you know, millions and millions worth beyond the sponsorship fee that they paid as new business that they've won just from our other partners. You know, they, they go talk to Aramco and Citibank and Peroni, and they're winning business and IT engagements amongst each other, and, and partially because they've spent three days networking together in a, in a paddock, which you wouldn't get, again, in a static environment without that team association. I think that's absolutely incredible, and from the sponsor perspective. And what I think is also equally as impressive is the access that you give to the everyday fan, and that's through the social media, your digital CRM. Um, I just feel like the access that we feel from a, from a fan perspective is incredible, and it has a lot to do with you know, the personalities has a lot to do with, you know, the strength of the brand. But talk to us about how you how you look at that strategy to the masses. Really, what does that equate to in media? You know, that's, that's a huge piece of this. I mean, you alluded to it briefly, but I spent three years uh, in a prior life uh, as the head of digital for AS Roma. And the whole concept there was access, you know, behind the scenes to the players and some of the things that are happening on and off the field. And um, I was pleased uh, to see a lot of that happening here with Aston Martin as well. And I do think that Drive to Survive 
has made that common and that because there's cameras everywhere, the drivers are much more comfortable opening up. And maybe, you know, had we attempted this three or four years ago or prior to the, you know, popularity surge and drive to survive, maybe that wouldn't have been as possible. So I have some empathy for some of the older car brands that maybe were there, heck, even before social media and are still very kind of um, uh, in, entrenched in certain ways. But uh, it just goes to show that right now, um, there's new platforms opening up. I mean, again, this, this TikTok phenomenon that's happened. TikTok is also one of our partners. Um, so it made sense to kind of push Fernando Alonso onto it, but he had zero. I mean, he literally didn't even have a TikTok and we started it, you know, six weeks ago or so. And he's got a million and a half or so followers and he's, he's putting out very engaging content. And uh, it just shows that, you know, we want to reach out to the, the, the casual fan out there um, but honestly, this begs uh, focus to, unlike any other sports team, we get no revenue from ticket sales. Uh, there's no luxury suite revenue. There's no parking. There's no concessions, no food and beverage, no merchandise. So you're like, wait a minute. So all of those things are done by the track and by F1. And there's a rev share formula that comes back to the teams based on how you finish the prior year. And most of that money is actually television money. So a sports team, you know, let's take the Miami Marlins. I was a guest of there last night and we were talking about, you know, they have, they have lots of other revenue streams um, by controlling lots of those assets. So we really have our car and the sponsorship that we can allocate and then the hospitality that we can provide. Um, so that sponsorship revenue and then there's the allocation from the TV and, and other kind of mixed Formula One revenue that's allocated. Um, I, I think it's it's um, exceptional the way that the team has come together um, and really the, the merging of the brand with also the historic brand at that point, which had taken a hiatus for a number of years. How do you push the, I consider F1 to be the tip of the spear in regards to automotive engineering. The things that happen in F1 eventually filter that. Is that something that you guys think about when you're working on your marketing campaigns and how it continuously feeds the parent brand, if you will, and make sure that we're selling some more as a market? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, And what the heck is probably part of this. Yeah, I, I think that, that it's inevitable that um, the association with a Formula One car does mean the highest speed cars out there, the most performance oriented cars, the ones that everyone is seeing, the global eyeballs, like billion and a half people watched Formula One races last year. The average TV race gets 70 million viewers. The average NFL game gets 18 million. The average NBA game gets 2 million viewers. And let's not talk about some of the other US sports because they're, you know, baseball and, and hockey probably get a fraction of a few hundred thousand viewers. But I think when you look at that type of engagement level and brand awareness, so if you're Aston Martin, now all of a sudden, if the car is out there and it's being showcased as a one of 10, because it's a, it's a limited club where only 10 brands are associated. And some of them aren't even car brands. You know, what's a Red Bull? It's a drink. And, and what's a Haas? It's a guy. Um, so some of the car are not even car brands. So when you boil it down, then there's a direct, uh, of course, implication that when you're featured, especially how you're featured. So in our case, we always try to have a certain type of uh, prestige imagery out there, um, an elegance that is, uh, again, uh, reflective of the Aston Martin brand. And they themselves, uh, the Aston Martin Laguna, will say this is our biggest marketing vehicle is the visibility we're getting through Formula One. If you don't mind me, if I could dig into the team a little bit. You know, what's it like? I think it's proven out to be very successful, but the dynamic between the driver's car, but also paired up with one of the most famous and impactful drivers of all time. Well, these, yeah, I mean, some of these would probably be best directed towards them, I think, uh, you know, uh, but I do think that it's, it's incredible to see um, if any of you guys watched the Baku race this last weekend? I mean, 
Fernando Alonso is messaging in uh, strategies for Lance Stroll and breaking and kind of giving him pointers through the messaging that everyone hears on television and almost like the type of thing that people, uh, you know, in his previous teams are probably like, wow, that's the same guy, you know, wow, wow, it's incredible. So you can see the camaraderie. I think obviously success helps, right? The fact that he's finishing on the podium um, and, and that, you know, but I think that a lot of credit goes to Lance. Um, Lance Stroll had a horrific injury, cycling injury, just a week before the first uh, race, and he was racing that very first race with, like, broken ribs and broken wrists. And, and I mean, can you imagine driving a regular car with broken wrists? I mean, this guy finished sixth, you know, passed something like four different drivers, uh, with with broken bones so you know he's um sacrificing literally his body for the team as well and i think uh again i i can't speak to we can't make uh lawrence any prouder both from a father but also from a business standpoint incredible I, looking ahead i think there's probably our final question before it's you know, enough. you know what are the team's goals and then from your, your goals for the same that i Kind of like yeah. That you're yeah, I mean, I think Lawrence Stroll laid out the path, which was a journey to be on. Um, you know, again, different reports, whether it's a five-year journey or ten-year journey, but let's use five because we're in year three and we're in second place right now. Not on wood. Um, we'd be, would have been ecstatic probably moving into the top five. Uh, but the type of – it's a very different sport than anything – you know, in baseball, they always say spring, spring's eternal, and they show up, and you never know. Everyone starts at zero and zero, but really, you kind of know if you've got a lot of players that everyone knows. In our case, like every team gets to recoil and rebuild the car all winter, and what's crazy there's like twelve thousand parts in the car, and over seventy five percent of them get completely reworked year on year. So it's not as surprising as you think that if you hire better aerodynamic people and better engineers and you bring in other points of view we've got folks that came from red bull came from mercedes uh, came from mclaren we've got uh you know dr drivers that came from alpine and raced at ferrari so we've got uh this this knowledge that can then all of a sudden allow the opportunity to kind of transform a car and then Lo and behold, you go from thinking you've made an improvement to, as of right now, performing at the second place um, car level. And again, there's loads of time left in the season. Other teams can make some tweaks and improvements, but there's no denying right now you've got a fast car, excited drivers, and a lot of positivity. Um, so what's the team goal is winning. Um, the business goals... I think it's becoming more and more profitable. Um, again, a lot of costs have to be sunk into the organization to start over, essentially, when you buy a, a bankrupt team, which was, of course, India. Um, everything from, I think we've, there's like 300-something people now. There's 800 people. So costs from people, uh, 300 million invested in a new building. Um, how does some of that money come back to us? We think it's with new partnerships, new sponsorships, or from a personal goal, um, you know, adding new businesses. And I'd love some of those to be, yeah, focus on the United States only, or, you know, brands that maybe in the past thought that there was international markets were watching the NFL or NBA. They actually are not as much as you'd think. I mean, I lived in London for two years and I'm a massive Boston sports fan. I'd say that again. Um, but like, if you saw, a Red Sox hat or a Celtics t-shirt. It was either like a fashion wear, but you'd never walk into any bar or restaurant and ever see any American sport. You'd see soccer, of course, and you'd see Formula One and maybe cricket. Not to mention Sunday mornings are a great time to watch with my five-year-old as well, so it works out. Well, thank you so much. Um, we have time for a question or two, one question. I think we nailed it. Well, thank you so much.